Dynamic text is not only coming, it's already pretty far snuck up on us. So you might ask, where do we go from here? You've probably heard of the Rosetta Stone. It was found in Egypt a long time ago, and part of it was inscribed in hieroglyphics, which no one understood at the time, and part of it was inscribed in Greek, in alphabetic Greek, which people did understand, and the two turned out to be translations of each other. It was from this stone that translations of all the hieroglyphics of Egypt have been born since then. Well, to young children, our own language, even our own alphabet, is as foreign as hieroglyphics. So wouldn't it be nice if we had some kind of Rosetta Stone for them as well? And in fact, we do. It's to be found, and the only place I know where to find it, is in the back of the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. It's an obscure appendix called the Indo-European Root Index but it's a truly wonderful source of information about the origin of the concepts and the structure of our language. In a world where text is static and letters move a little less slowly than continents, this obscure appendix is just that, obscure. But if you give it motion, it's a world you can swim in. It traces the relationships between the tens of thousands of complex words we modern adults know and the very few hundred primitive roots and concepts which our forefathers on the banks of the Euphrates and the Indus rivers used to describe their world. It connects words one to another. It binds them together in a fantastic, poetic, very often funny cascade of metaphors tripping over metaphors. Take, for instance, the word hippopotamus. It's a word adults rarely use, but children are fascinated by such animals. It's really just two old root words stuck together, hippo for horse and potamos meaning of the river. It means river horse, and that was a very good description, perhaps a child's description long ago. Now, the hippo root didn't go very far. It went off to Hippodrome and to some surnames like uh, Hipparchus and Hippocrates. But the potamos root was from an old root that seemed to mean uh, things that go whoosh, something that goes whoosh, and it sounded like hut or put or put or put. And from that root, we've had a cascade of many, many, many terms in our language, as well as many in many other Indo-European languages. The old root word meant to push, like uh, a river, or the wind, or a bird, or something falling. And from that push concept came meaningful metaphors we find today in words like pterodactyl and helicopter, and the pen that we write, write with because the pen was once a feather, and because P became PH, which sounds like F in many words, we got the word feather itself from this same original root. We got scientific terms like centripetal and asymptote, and we got medical terms like tomaine, tosa, symptom, and pterygoid, all from that same old push word. I contend that we should let children play with language just as they've learned to play with sand and water and mud and tinker toys. We should let them explore the world of pushing, gyrating, moving, spinning, colorful words, the old metaphors, and see how the language has developed. And this isn't just important for very young children. It goes all the way through education to practically all language acquisition. It includes field of study of other romance languages, for instance, cognates, uh, or the acquisition of the medical vocabulary. Until recently, all these observations and, and thoughts have been uh, fairly moot because we haven't been able to move the text around and make the metaphors visual enough, electric enough, to be important in our educational processes. And in a way, these metaphors, these thoughts, these uh, nuggets of information are really not the kind of thing that should be taught explicitly in academic institutions. They're more the type of thing that need to be found in curiosity-based learning environments.